Hi, this is Phil Cash and the Winter Circle, Season 2, Episode 10. We are happy tonight to have Matt Caruso, the winner of the Collis k and two-day national PRS match, the AG Cup match, uh, with us tonight. He's going to share some of his knowledge and experience and a little secrets that allow him to go out there and win a match and me, not yet. So maybe he can give me some guidance on what I can do to kind of break that barrier. And so... We're excited to have you on tonight, Matt. Good job, buddy. Congratulations on the victory. Thanks, Phil. Really uh, excited to be on here with you finally. <laughs> it's, it's um, this is your first time on the Winter Circle. Yep, I've been I've been waiting. I've been watching and waiting and hoping. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know the time the time is upon us. So, um, so let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and do this thing. You ready? Sure. Yeah. Hey, man. Well, why don't you tell uh, tell the audience kind of how you got into shooting long range and how you kind of got into doing what you're doing now? Let's kind of hear the back story. Okay, sure. Um, it's kind of kind of out of nowhere. Um, I basically moved south from the north. I try not to tell too many people that, but before that, I had like no experience with firearms at all, and uh, you know, took took a few things to the range with buddies over the years in college, and you know, it was all just hitting paper and you know who cares it was just going boom so it was fun and didn't do anything for the longest time and then I ended up in Tennessee and um there was a guy that I knew through my industry at work that I bumped into a couple of times and the last time I had seen him it was at an FFL pickup I was picking up an AR or something at a army surplus store and he said he saw me and said oh were you gonna zero that thing and he said why don't you come out I got property. You could, you could zero it there and we'll hang out or whatever. So I said, sure. We went out there, did that. And, um, he kind of dropped this weird looking big gun in front of me, which not knowing anything, I was like, what is that? And, uh, you know, if we saw it now, we'd all probably be like, what is that? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't say the specifics because I don't want to knock anybody, but it's, it's, it was a much older thing at that time. But, um, but it was a precision 308. And he said, why don't you try to hit that target down there at 300 yards? And I dropped a few rounds at 300 yards. And he was like, that's actually really good. Do you want to learn how to do this? And he was a sponsored shooter. He was actually uh, on uh, the bug holes team. And, um, and I was like, okay, sure. I, you know, training from a professional sounded really, really exciting. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, well, there's this match at the end of the summer. And, um, you know, you could sign up for it. And I'll teach you and train you and get you ready for it. And it was the 2016 gap grind. So wow. going from nothing to that, and he told me a little bit about it, and I was definitely intimidated. I'm like, it sounds like pretty intense. He's like, oh, you'll be fine. Sign up and let me know when you're all signed up. And I sign up, and the only thing available was pro slots. All the AM spots were gone. And he was like, don't worry about it. He's like, you'll be you'll be good to go. I'm like, this sounds crazy. I'm going to this match as a pro, and um, we probably went out there a few times over the summer, just shooting some factory ammo and trained me up, practiced a little bit. I think I felt more confident, but uh, I don't know. I don't think I knew much. And um, the day of the train up, he puts the gun down in front of me and I'm like, well, that looks different. He's like, yep, it's a uh, 20, it's a, uh, what do you have? 223 Ackley and it had no break, but it had like this huge heavy barrel on it. So I trained with a 308 and then he put me in this uh, 223 and uh, he's like, trust me, you'll love it. And, and I did great. Like, honestly, I, I don't know what my hit percentage was. It wasn't, it wasn't that good overall, but me and my, my am, he was a super experienced guy uh, compared to me. And uh, he had a great spirit, even though I told him like, Hey man, I don't know much. I shouldn't be a pro. He's like, don't worry, we'll have a good time. And, and we took like 16th as a, in the teams and uh nice. and you know I, yeah and and just the fact that i was even anywhere up there i think individually i was like you know you couldn't scroll hard enough to find to find me individually but as a team we did good and i won a barrel and i was like well, what do i do with this and the guy that taught me he's like you know find a gunsmith and we'll build your rifle and so my first uh precision rifle was just like a trued up remington 700 with a 65 creedmoor um and it was uh smith by uh isaac frank out of indiana oh yeah yeah 
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, and I still I have a couple of his barrels, and I always look at them fondly because he's not with us anymore. But um, that was how I started, and the thing hammered. And I would just basically go to a couple of um, K and M club matches. I went to Alabama a couple times. That's where I met you. Um, had no clue who you were. And I was like, "Who's that?" And you're like, "It's Phil." You don't know who Phil is? <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was kind of funny, but. Um, yeah, that was 2016, and I think for the first three years, I probably only shot a handful of club matches and, like, a couple two-day matches, like uh, long-range shooter experience in Kentucky, maybe the two-day in Alabama. I can't remember now. And uh, and the gap grind, I would do that each year. And, um, and that was kind of it. Um, I'd go out to K&M and practice a bunch, but, like, man, it's like the blind leading the blind. If you don't have somebody – you know, telling you where you're going wrong or how to, how to do better. You know, it's like, it's really hard to progress. And as much as I was out there, I was just winging it. Um, and the guy who taught me, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't get together as much anymore. And it was just kind of me on my own. And I met another couple of shooters I'd shoot with here and there. Matty Trosco was out there sometimes. And, oh yeah. you know, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, but it was just, I was just there. I wasn't really like progressing or really aiming to uh, hit any goals. And then I took a job that took me out to Texas. And um, if I back up to one of the first matches, probably it was probably the gap, Brian. I remember talking to some guys that were from Oklahoma and Texas at the match. And I said something to them about the wind and they laughed at me. And, you know, I'm at K&M talking about the wind and these guys were like, that's not wind, man. And they're like, <laughs> we shoot 20, 30, 30 mile an hour winds. And I was like, no way. So there was already this thing about like Texas and Oklahoma. And, and when I moved out to Texas, I was like, I'm going to do better. I want to figure this thing out. And I don't want to just go out there and like send my first shot just to see what happens and then try to figure it out. Like I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. And um, ended up going to all the Navasota matches I could once I got my feet planted in, uh, in uh, Houston. And I met some people, uh, Derek Webster was the first guy who got me on a sandbag because I was like, three years behind the curve on that. I was still shooting like a light polyfill and like a heavy nylon bag, <laughs> uh, you know, bouncing all over the targets and stuff. And he put me on that bag and he's like, try that. And I was like, Holy smokes, you're kidding me. It's that much easier, you know? And, uh, and, um, uh, got into a six BRA and with that combo it was the first match. I took that six BRA to a match after ditching the six, five and, uh, won a trophy match and a scope. Uh, the club match there that they do uh, in June. And it was just like, all of a sudden, it just like took off. And if I was hooked before, I don't know what you call it now, but I was just, I was just so committed to just sticking with this and seeing how far I could go with it. And that, that's like, that was like 20, I think it was 2020. Yeah. And I think and that's I just, when, uh, when, after, I think earlier that year, you'd reached out to me and, and we'd kind of chatted via email and, then at the uh, the match, the fall match, I think at, um, at Arena is when I think you came in like fourth place. And I remember, you know, I didn't know who you were other than just a name on an email. And then and you came up, introduced yourself, and I'm like, oh, oh, you're that Matt, okay. And and, <laughs> and I gave you the fourth place trophy, and and then shortly after that, you joined our team, and it's been it's been great ever since. So yeah, yeah it sure has. Yeah, that's that's a great story, man. First first. First match of the two day at K and M and the Gap Grind. You know, I wonder how many. <clears throat> I don't think I have talked to anyone at this on this podcast. You know, the, the Winter Circle that that's kind of how they got into it. And there are so many shooters. I mean, like that match. You know, for those of you who haven't shot that match before, it's. I mean, it's common to have between three hundred and twenty five and four hundred and twenty five shooters at the match. You know, half of them are. I mean, the, you know, the the whole concept behind it. As having a professional shooter or top level shooter and, and a kind of an entry level shooter. And that's a lot of shooters kind of going to that match at a great place. And, and it's certainly, I mean, that if you talk about one match that <clears throat> has grown this sport probably more than any other one, it's that one without question. And, but I think you're the first one that out of their first match is now a, a two day PRS match winner. So there you go. You have that distinction. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely kind of a, uh, zero to a hundred kind of feeling, you know, all, all at once is huge match is it, uh, it was a lot to take in. <laughs> yeah. 
And so that's the location that um, that you went to last weekend to win the match up there at uh, at the college. At the and it was an AG Cup match, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell us about the match. Oh, um, well, it was it was a really fun match. I think um, Shannon always does a good job with the course of fire and the facility is just amazing. Um, I've always loved it there, and and I've always done well there. Um, it's just one of those places I would hate to miss. Like I can't make every one of those matches. I haven't made the gap grind in a while, but I always try to go once a year. Um, but uh, this time the target seemed a little bit bigger. Uh, looking at everything on Saturday, there was a lot more big, small, and uh, it's just so funny. You know, you get on the match book and you're reading some of the plate sizes and he puts all the inches and the shapes of the targets in the match book. So I'm looking at all that. And I'm like, I always hate saying this, but I'm like, these targets feel kind of generous. I'm like, I'm going to regret that tomorrow. And, and it's true, you know, like there were some bigger targets compared to the last, the last match or two that I had shot at K&M. Um, but there was this nice healthy target. And then next to it was like this little freaking circle. And you're like, I don't know if I can hit that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I had that feeling where I'm like, I shouldn't have said that mm -hmm. yesterday that these targets are definitely still very challenging. And, you know, he, he really puts the, uh, the target size and the distance combos, he really nails that for, for that location and the amount of wind you get. It's, um, we were talking actually after Saturday, he said, you know, I think there was a couple of shooters only down one and he was a little surprised because he didn't want it to be too, too easy. And I was like, I think Sunday, I think tomorrow is going to even that out a little bit because we were expecting a little more wind and, <clears throat> and the wind came, it wasn't a lot, but it was just enough. I think that it just made it a little bit more challenging. Some people kind of fell off. And uh, so I had a good Saturday. Um, I think uh, I was down five and the leaders were down one and there was a couple guys at three and I was at three and then had a couple drop on my last stage on day, day one. Um, and then day two, I just, uh, I just kind of kept shooting both days kind of felt just in the zone. I mean, um, by midday, I knew I was shooting pretty good, but I, I was, I would have bet a hundred dollars easily that uh, one of those guys was still crushing it you know at least as good as i was um so and towards the end of the day i think you know keith kind of said something like you know if you if you clean this next one or two you're doing really good and i'm like man eh, you know i don't know whatever um <laughs> yeah nothing like putting that kind of pressure on you right <laughs> yeah and honestly it wasn't pressure because i was so convinced that i wasn't winning nothing i just i knew that uh you know there's so many so many studs that show up to these matches and you know, I don't get bent out of shape about it, but when you drop one or two at a match like that, you kind of know, like, well, <laughs> it's not just like, oh, it's just one or two. It's like, oh, you drop one or two, that's a good chunk, depending on what match you're at. K&M, that could be, you know, five or ten places. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I wasn't stressed about it. I just figured, you know, eh, maybe maybe I'll get a trophy out of it. Maybe I won't. I don't know. Um and a couple other leaders were in my squad and I watched them drop a few here and there. And I thought I might actually get ahead of them a little bit. So I figured I was doing okay. Um, and, and I, I told Shannon the same thing about after day two, I said, look, even the cleans on Saturday when the winds were really light and Saturday also, anytime I cleaned a bunch of stages, I definitely shot well, but every time I'd clean a stage, I remember hitting the last target and just, Oh, thank goodness. Oh my gosh. Like <laughs> just kind of feeling like some of those shots were just not going to land. I'm like, that is a small target where I just don't know how confident I feel about this next one. And it would hit, um, it was just my weekend, you know, I, I was pretty consistent. Um, so after the last stage, I cleaned the last stage and you know, my buddy Keith, he's always there. You know, oh, I think you got it. I think you got it. I'm like, there's no way. And, you know, make our way down the crazy gravel hill and, you know, put all our gear up and start finding out that this one dropped off and this guy dropped off and this one dropped off and uh, Jeff Gary was on we couldn't find. I'm down at the ceremony and I'm like, where's Jeff? Damn it. You know, can't find him. And I was finally like actually suspense, you know, feeling the suspense of like maybe I did do really well and he was the only anomaly. And then finally he came up to me and told me what he dropped and he was like, congrats. I'm like, holy smokes, I can't believe 
I want it. I, I've been saying it for years, you know, I want my name on that board. You know, I want to get up there and I don't know. I just don't usually assume it's going to happen. So that was, uh, it was a really, just an amazing feeling. Of course, you know, winning anything is, is always fun, but uh, that's, that's a cool one for me to win. I really was excited about it. Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, it's a loaded field and AG cut match and, I mean, there's always a lot of shooters at that match. I know they had well over – do they have, what, 250, 260? I think, I think the final number of people who had scores was like 230. Yeah, that's still, that's still one of the – other than the – you know, the guy, Brian, probably the, one of the top two or three heaviest attended matches in the country. I mean, that's – got a lot of talent there. I mean, that's quite an accomplishment. So, um, so there was another occurrence that happened at that range, and I happened to be present for back here a couple of years ago, going down the hill to the um, to, <laughs> to the to the uh, to the back range. But there, I think it's changed since the last time I was there. But um, but that was ridiculously impressive, and I'm kind of like for you to kind of share that story if you can. <laughs> I guess I kind of brought it up. Um, yeah, I just I've had a lot of highs and lows at K and M. Now that I'm thinking about it, um, I started there, and I've had a couple of wins there, and uh, and then this adventure. Um, all right, so it was I don't even know it was probably 2021 at the Collis match, and um, I think it was day one, and I was shooting really good. I remember feeling like, oh, this is my day. I'm having a good time, and the side by sides and the little personnel carrier. Uh, trailers that they had attached to the Kubotas were running people around like they are now, but uh, across that gravel parking lot, you know, right before it goes way down and then way back up for that last back range, um, we were headed that way. And I was on the last, like, I was on like the last two square inches of the corner of the back end of that personnel carrier with my backpack, you know, pushing me off the edge. I had my rifle in one hand, my tripod in the other, like nothing really holding me on and didn't think much of it. We've been riding those things around for a while. Um, but uh, a couple of people told me that the guy was going too fast. I'm not trying to say whose fault it was. I mean, I was also barely seated on the damn thing, but um, coming up over the crest of that hill, I heard some people yelling like, slow down. And all of a sudden we go over the, the, the crest of that hill and the, the personnel carrier with no suspension just, get, you know, bucks over the top of it. And, I'm on the back and everybody, everybody kind of came up out of their seat for like a couple inches. And I think everybody came back down, but then I came back down like the last quarter inch and I just felt it. I was like, Oh no, I'm, I'm going, I'm going down. And I knew it. So even though I was facing sideways and we were going like, I don't know, 10, 10, 12 miles an hour going over this thing, I ended up uh, trying to run, run it out because I knew I was going to fall and just cartwheel. So with everything in hand, I actually stepped off and tried to run it out downhill. I think I got two good strides and my tripod was still stuck on the, uh, on the personnel carrier cart thing and, and sprawled me out like a pancake. And I just went belly surfing down that horrible k and gravel for about, I don't know, like 30 yards, like almost all halfway down that hill. And, uh, Actually, it's funny. You were there, but um, I always can picture Aaron Hip of all people. Uh, you know, we don't, I don't know him very well, but he was on the back of that thing. And I can remember his face as I was going down. And he was reaching off the back like this. And he's going, no. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I ran, I slid down the hill. My gun just smacked into the ground as I tried to catch myself. And um I think before I even stopped sliding, I was kind of making my way back to my feet. And I was like, I got to check zero. I got to check my zero. <laughs> and I was like, he's graded, you know, um, you know, you see like all the, the white, your skin's all white and cut, but not bleeding yet. It was all that everywhere. And uh, they ran me down the zero range. I could tell Shannon had no clue what happened when we were like, yeah, he fell off the car. He wants to check zero. He's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and the best part of that whole story was i remember like if i could have recorded that and used it as a commercial for the people whose products i use we knock over our guns all the time and like it's 50 50 if it's gonna shift at all and and it's always something surprising like you knock it over two inches in the grass and you'll hear someone say that they were two mils off or something crazy and you know for what i went through i shot 
like a ragged hole at a hundred. And I was like, no, there's no way. And, <laughs> and I had permission to go out to steal. So I found a target at 600 and I cranked up my elevation and I shot like a single giant splatter with three shots, water line at 600. And I'm like, there's just no way. And I came back to a hundred and just kept putting them in the same hole. And I was like, there's no way I have nothing to do to fix this. I don't have to fix anything. There's no way. And I couldn't believe it. And I went back and shot the rest of the match. And I can't remember if that was one that I did pretty good at or not, but I didn't do bad. And my gun just kept shooting like it was supposed to. It was wild. Yeah. I, th I think you finished in like fifth that match, but I remember when you came back up to the, up to the, uh, the top of the hill after that. And we were all amazed and couldn't like you couldn't believe that, like how in the world did that fall with it was that violent uh and that much energy result in no movement at all of your optic and your zero that that was amazing and i found rocks in places there weren't supposed to be rocks <laughs> awesome <laughs> there was like rocks underneath my mag like in my mag holder underneath my magazine and i have no idea how it got past my mag it was wild yeah yeah, I mean, you've done well at that location. You won the, um, I mean, you won the the PRS uh, finale back there in 2022, I believe, right? Yep. Yeah, actually, the shirt that I have on right now. That's a great shirt, Phil. Yeah, yeah, I wore that just for you tonight, buddy. <laughs> that was a good year. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, uh, you've done well at that. And and for those of you who have not been to k and M, I I mean, my goodness, it is, it's the Augusta National of our sport. I mean, it is incredibly beautiful it's very well maintained uh shannon every time we go up there uh he's doing something new with the facility i mean a new you know new targets you know, he, he loves to move dirt he like I, he, he moves more dirt and puts more de more gravel down than anyone i've ever met um and all for improving the facility and it's incredible so if you hadn't gone there man find a reason to go because you certainly yeah. regret it but yeah absolutely Oh, so now what, um, now tell me a little bit about, uh, about your, uh, about your rifle setup with what, what cartridge and, and, and bullet and speed that you're running. Okay. Um, I'm running a six BRA. It's pretty much what I ran since I, you know, kind of started getting competitive in this. Um, it's chambered by Studeville precision. It's in a Bartland barrel, pretty much stuck with them, uh, exclusively. I just, I, I'm really like a, if it doesn't, if it doesn't need to be fixed, don't change it. Like that is, that is like a hundred percent how I run this thing. Um, I run an, an MPA chassis. I've been running a matrix at first and then uh, I got picked up on the team thanks to you. And uh, I've been running matrix and matrix pro ever since. Um, uh, impact action uh, with, from Tate. Uh, Collis Coats, uh, that one particular that went down on, down on the hill was an old 624, just held up really good. Actually, it had a huge knock in it, too. There was a big ding in it, and I was worried from that. But uh, so those those scopes are tougher than you might think. Um, uh, Bix triggers, uh, wee bad bags. I know that's not part of the rifle, but that's just like yeah. going down all yeah. the all the gear that I use, all the different products. Um well, now let me ask you now, but you're running, you're running a BRA. What bullet are you running? Uh, 105 hybrid. And what kind of speed? Uh, right around 2,800. And I've, I've fluctuated a little bit with, uh, you know, environmentals throughout the year or, um, you know, a jug here and there where they get a little dry or something, they start speeding up. But I usually, I usually try to keep it in the low 28s. I mean, I think, uh, I think k and I just shot, it was like 2790 something yeah. like that well you know there's obviously been a trend in our sport over the past year year and a half uh to kind of go in between a six and a six five to a 25 caliber yeah you got uh i mean you're almost halfway in between the two sizes and you there's some very um there's some very high bc bullets uh specifically like the burger 135 hybrid which has got a g7 of what 335 or somewhere in that range um and so you know, have you ever thought about making that change? I, I thought about it and, um, it, it goes against every fiber of my being to even admit that, but, um, 
Cause, cause I'm, I'm like, if anybody, if anybody knows me, they know that I will, I will question somebody 10 times, you know, but why did you change it? Why, why, you know, cause there's usually not a huge reason now, like going with the, the bigger bullets and stuff. Um, I get the reasons. I just, if I had more time, I would consider it more, but I'm, I'm so busy that, uh, the idea of learning a new cartridge or, you know, doing low development or, you know, if you got to like fire form some stuff or whatever, like, it's just every one of those things that somebody might just kind of nonchalant be like, yeah, we're going to go out tomorrow and, you know, you know, uh, do a ladder test on a 25 pre, you know, they say that, you know, like Keith will say that every other day. <laughs> and, and to me, I'm like, I just can't fathom exhausting myself that much energy to go learn something else right now. Um, it's just where I'm at. But that said, I do have a couple other cartridges. I just don't shoot them. I have a 25 barrel sitting here and I have most of the components to do it. I just haven't crossed the bridge. And again, it's one of those things that it's like, I'd love to try it and love it, but I've tried a friends of mine and I'm like, I know I'll learn it better than just the one day I tried it, but my first thoughts were like, nah, you know, I'd rather stick with what I know. Um, and then, uh, I did try a 22 BRA um, after Keith started running those 22 dashers and, and it was, it felt great to shoot, but I never took it anywhere. You know, I basically just wrecked half of my brass. I had like 20 times fired Lapua six BR brass that I necked down. So that stuff didn't, didn't hold up well and I didn't pursue it. So it's sitting in the closet, you know, I just haven't got to it. Um, and now I have to learn 308 for, uh, for the world event. So I'll be in the, limited division so that one i don't really have a choice i'm gonna have to figure that out you gotta break out of your comfort zone that's good yeah be, it's kind of going back to your roots though starting you're practicing out there in tennessee before you shot the, the gap grind with a 308 and now you're going back yeah there. that's a good point if i can do it then i can do it now <laughs> well you know i find it uh interesting like i mean i've been in the sport since you know since 2015 you know, back then, you know, we were shooting 6.5 Creedmoors and 6.5 by 47 Lapuas, and then it started going down to, you know, really fast six millimeters, you know, Creedmoor running at, you know, 105 or 108 or whatever at, you know, 3,100. You know, let's get it, let's get that bullet to the target as fast as we can and cheat the wind, right? Let's let's take the wind out of it, just center plate every shot. And of course, which is ridiculous, but, you know, it's already going slow and now you're kind of seeing a trend going back up to the 25 and even the 6.5. Like, I think like Morgan, you know, Morgan's been running a 6.5, uh, Creedmoor, yeah. I don't think we're running the 153 and a half maybe. Slope, yeah. I mean, 20, 26, 50, 26, 80. I know Jake Vibbert was kind of, you know, he won a match last year kind of running that kind of speed. And, you know, and then um, a number of the winners this year have been in that, that Dasher BR, BRA realm, running the 105 slow, I think I think Clay, if I remember correctly, Clay. I think that's what he ran. Isn't that what, isn't that what Clay uh, Blackout runs? I think maybe. I don't know. I've seen him shoot some heavier stuff. I think he's aged up, and uh, I don't. I don't know. I can't keep track of uh, yeah. most of the other. <clears throat> but it's kind of just kind of interesting, though, how um, you know, in in each each of those, you know, a slow six millimeter, you know, kind of a medium speed twenty five, and a really slow. Six five have kind of, I mean, there have been multiple winners each year, kind of in each of those, and it's such a, a you know, I mean, the, going from a, a slow six millimeter to a slow six five, I mean, that's a different world. I yeah. Mean, not a, I mean, obviously, you're the the way the bullet behaves. You know, the BC is much higher. It's heavier on the target, so you know your impacts are going to show a swing, a much greater effect left to right. Um, seeing splatter on the target and misses, what have you, on that six five, but the recoil is so much more. I mean, it's a lot more. I can tell you, I've been shooting a 25 Creed more this year and I like, I like the ballistic performance, but that recoil management, you know, when you come from, and I shot a BR for years is, is, you know, it spoils you. And then when you go with something that's got a little bit more bump to it, you got to pay a lot more attention. And, and, you know, but I mean, like, <clears throat> so obviously you're shooting, I mean, like how much does your rifle weigh? 22 pounds. So it's actually, heavy, but it's not super heavy. Yeah, I, when I ran the Matrix uh, with the side rails, when you first came out with the side rails, I put those on and I had the weight kit in it and all that. I think I was more around 
uh, like 25 or so with, with a mag loaded mag in there. And, uh, and I weigh it with my bipod on because when I shoot positional, I always leave it on. Uh, I like the extra weight out front, so I don't strip it unless I'm pretty sure I'm going to hit something with it and get interference. Um, but this one's 22, 22 and a half pounds, somewhere around there. Um, and uh, I don't know. I just, I feel like there's such a trade-off. I guess my question, like the why, right? Why, Phil? <laughs> what? Um, every person is going to be different, right? So I can't sit here and say one way or the other what I think is, is truly better overall. But for me, um, I, again, I only tried a couple things like a day here and a day there just to kind of feel it out. Um, so I'm actually one of the worst people to ask about it. But I'd ask you, like, well, how's your, not your ballistic performance, but how's your performance now that you've been switched over for a year? And can you, can you confidently say that it's from the bullet if you're doing better, or is it from the fact that it's your 28th year shooting the PRS? <laughs> well, uh, not, not the latter reason I can tell you. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, there are, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like there is a, there is a stage over at Alabama precision, uh, which is you know off the top of that Connex, and you typically it's you know they, they run they run you know different target arrays out there, but it's normally eight hundred nine hundred thousand eleven and twelve hundred right, and you got two shots or you may go you know near to far and then back or whatever, but that stage has always you know running that BR has always just gotten the best of me, and it just got in my head, <clears throat> and I'm like okay well let's just let's try something a little bit heavier, and so that like this year. Every time I've shot over there, I've either cleaned that stage or maybe dropped one. So mm. like, I can tell, and my, my shooting hadn't gotten any better, but it's just that bullet, you know, that 135 run just kind of cheats the wind a little bit better. And so, yeah, it, you know, there's some things I like about it, but like inside 500 yards on small targets when it's a, you know, pure positional stage, man, it's harder to see what's going on. And, you know, and that like, you know, everybody has their abilities when it comes to, you know, how they make their reactions to what, where they're aiming at the target, right? Do you watch trace? Do you watch impacts on the target? Do you watch the way the target swings or a combination of all of them or just one of them? <clears throat> you know, and, and my 58 year old eyes aren't as good at seeing like, uh, yeah, I mean, I can tell which way the target's swinging and that's about it, you know, so there's advantages and disadvantages. Right. Um, but, you know, I mean, like, I think <clears throat> kind of in hindsight, probably what I'll end up doing is kind of having a setup for a match that I know is typically going to be smaller targets, shorter distances, and a setup for, you know, something that where maybe longer distances and maybe more wind. But, um, yeah. But I, but I, you know, I look, I miss the BR. I mean, I do. I mean, it's, you know, you, it's, you see everything. I mean, you see everything. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what happened was when I borrowed a friend's 25 Creed and I shot it all day and, uh, and I shot off like a pipe fence at the end of the day with like my last mag of his ammo. And then I grabbed my BRA just like as a come full circle and see what I think. And I put my, my BRA on that pipe and then I shot and it was like, Ooh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I saw, you know, and, and for, for the extra impact, you know, force on target with the 25 Creed. And again, I, I had no practice with it other than right then and there. I had not figured it out for sure. Um, but going back to the, the, the BRA, uh, as soon as I got on, I'm like, Oh man, I see everything compared to having that, that boom go off, you know, in that 25 Creed, it just felt so much better. I was like, you know what, for now, I'm not pursuing it. I've got everything I need. And if I, if I have the time and the resources and the, the drive to go after it, I'll try it. Maybe after the world, when I have to shoot a 308, you know, that'll be a good time to step down into a 25 and it probably won't feel like, it probably will feel like a, a BRA. Um, but until I'm you, just- Until you shoot your BRA again. <laughs> if I shoot my BRA, I'm gonna feel like it's just like a little laser. Um, I just, I just feel mm -hmm. like there's so, there's so many people. Like, don't get me wrong. If, if you're, if you're a very competitive person in the sport and you're doing well and you're successful in it, um, reaching your goals, and you switch out to a different caliber, like the, you could take, you could take any of the top twenty or so guys and give them. We could all trade rifles, and I'm sure we'd all probably do pretty good. Um, you know, you hear about these guys, like you just mentioned Clay, you know, he shot B 
big, small, all kinds of different calibers. You know, you see, you see other people jumping around and they usually do good. It's not, it's not something that I think is going to make or break anyone's performance. Um, but like for anybody who's not quite there yet, I feel like unless you're losing a match by those one or two shots at a thousand yards in the high mirage, you know, it's like, I think you just need to stick with what you got and, and learn it like the back of your hand. Like that's so valuable. And, and I just, you know, we always talk about it and I know I've heard a lot of people on the podcast talk about it too, that just, you know, jumping around and, and, you know, trying a new piece of gear every, every week um, does not work for most people, especially when you're, when you're riding that learning curve, you need to just stay put and, and, you know, ride it as far as it takes you until you get stuck. You know, that's, that's what I would think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I mean, you know, there's, it'll be interesting at the end of the year. Uh, I think Cal Zan at that, you know, precision rifle blog, I think he'll put something out. They will talk about uh, the percentage of top level shooters and what cartridge that they are shooting. And I still think the six millimeter is probably what most people are shooting. I mean, I think across the board, that's going to be still the most popular caliber. And it's probably not even close. Um, I think it's just the best balance. You know, there's there's definitely there's definitely big advantages to those bigger calibers. And there's definitely shooters out there that will master those cartridges and just crush everybody when they get on their day with that caliber specifically. But I think, like, it's still the easy button. You know, it gives you the ballistics. It gives you good impact force it gives you good read on the plate and it gives you um low recoil which is just such a huge part to this you know i mean but i i tell people like i'll throw myself under the bus i i have not been the best person with recoil management um as far as consistently now in a match uh, i don't know i don't know if we're getting off topic but i was just telling someone yesterday i don't know what it is i train like i'm gonna like I'm going to play the game and when I play the game, it's like I train, like that's what I do in work and in life and in, and in PRS. And, but for whatever reason, when I'm training, if I'm trying to practice spotting, the more I'm trying, the worse I do. And I'll have muzzle rise that would make you sick. And, uh, and I'm like, man, why am I doing that? And then you, and then I'll get in a match and at k and I, I, I cringe when I hear people say this because it's like, it's hard to be believe sometimes, but like I almost watch every shot. I won't say I watch every shot, but I watch almost every shot, uh, at least it, at least in some way where I was confident where it was hitting. And it's just I get a different zone in the match, and I, I can't duplicate it in training. Um, there's something about that extra pressure that I just commit a little differently physically and mentally to each one of those shots. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I just uh, – I see, I see really well with the 6BRA, and I just – I don't want to mess it up, <laughs> you know. Well, when you're when you're saying you're watching every shot, what are you watching? Are you like, are you watching? Are you watching the bullet hit the target? Are you watching the way the target kind of behaves when you hit it, or are you watching trace? I mean, kind of give me that rundown. I'm not a trace guy. Um, I do see it. Uh, I do. I do see it. Uh, I don't want to say all the time, but I see it a lot. I'd say less than half the time I see it. But and when I do see it, it's like. I'm not thinking about it. I'm not using it. I just, I could tell you, I probably saw it, <laughs> but um, I actually got away from even chasing that because um, I've just been duped by it so many times. I've, I've seen trace clear as day and thought hundred percent. I know exactly what my next shot needs to be based on what I just saw. And I was so wrong just the way the light or the wind was and how it, I, I don't know if it's correct to say this, but like it, it almost highlights a certain, a certain part of the trace, you know, you'll get a little more visibility on one side or the other, and it's not really where it went. And um, I don't know if that's right or wrong. That's just what my experience has been. And uh, because of that, I've just like, I don't use it unless there's nothing else that's going to give me any report on a miss. And then I'll let myself know, like, you need to look for it. And at least it'll be something you can use if you've got nothing. But um all that to say, I mostly am watching the plate. Um, point of impact is great on clean steel. Um, I I still have a hard time spotting my exact point of impact on dirty steel, like unless it's it leaves a nice mark or 
or, or something telling. Um, and I don't shoot, you know, like eight tips or something where you get the spark or anything like that. So for me, it's usually, um, I'm reading the plate, I'm reading the plate and I'm a big, like, um, I don't know if it's statistics or probability, but like, if you imagine my brain's a funnel and I'm dumping all kinds of stuff in there, everything from what I'm getting on my Kestrel, what I'm seeing down range, what, what the dust is doing from a different shooter on a different target over there. What you just told me coming off the stage, you know, I'm taking all that and I'm putting it all in there. What I just shot on the last stage and it's all going through this funnel and um, you know, and then it comes out the bottom and I have this, like mental confidence in, in what I think it should be. Um, so that plus what the plate's going to read is, is really m basically how I'm reading my shots. So if I'm hitting the right side of the plate, I may or may not see the exact impact, but I'm reading the plate, how it's whipping, um, and even, even light and dark in the shadow, if the sun's really strong on one side or the other, um, or you have like a, um, a, a hit indicator, you know, so many times you'll see the hit indicator. If you hit it on the, on the opposite side, the hit indicator will turn towards you and you'll get a nice big bright red light flashing at you. And if you hit the, the light in the hit indicator side, it kind of disappears and you might get like a little tiny flicker at first or nothing at all. And then a second later you start seeing it because it's finally turning back. Like my brain's running like a little calculator all the time, you know, just calculating the probabilities of all this different stuff that I'm seeing. So, um, but at this match in particular, I don't know, I think it's because there's a lower wind match. You know, there's a lot less variables. Your, your vision doesn't have to, like, pay attention to nearly as much. I, at least that's how I feel. And I was able to watch the bullet kind of landing quite often on the target, which is just, it's not normal for me. I'll just admit that flat out. <laughs> so I just had my weekend. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm a big plate reader. That's, that's really the basic, that's the biggest thing I do. Yeah. And look at that, um, you know, that's one of the questions I've been asking here recently is like, what is what's your, what's your vision? Like what's your quality of vision? Are you 2020 or you 2010? Uh, do you wear glasses? I mean, like, yeah, what's your, what's your quality of your ability to see clearly? I'm 2020. As far as I know, I, I would never even have thought this, except I think it was, uh, I don't know. You just mentioned it on a different podcast that somebody said they were better than that. I've never tried to read the lines below 2020, um, you know, for qualification. Like I might, I can, I can see them. So maybe I'm better than 2020, but I know I'm at least, at least 2020 vision, um, you know, and, and I think another thing that goes into it, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's um, these other hobbies that make me better at shooting or if shooting makes me better at that or whatever. But like, I, I play some high speed type stuff, you know, like I play handball and racquetball and, there's all this hand-eye coordination things are happening really fast. Um, you know, and it just seems like, I don't know how much it's always vision based as much as it's also a lot of like mental, mental speed, you know what I mean? Um, well, you, you know, know, one of the things that, um, it's kind of like, I think when I was, when I was talking to Nathan and he was referencing, like watching where each bullet was hitting on the target. And he kind of kept saying it during, you know, during the podcast. I finally asked him, like, I mean, are you really seeing, like, the bull each each shot hit like a spot on the target? He, he, his answer, if I remember correctly, was kind of like, "Yeah, duh." <laughs> and, and I'm like, "Man, okay, I'm great when the when the target's white and I'm the first shooter." You know, like I'm really good at that part of it. But you know, and and I've had a, I've had a number of people kind of reach out to me you know, after, um, after I've been asking that question and I, it's almost been, uh, okay, now I understand like other people can just see better than I can. And then it's almost a bit discouraging, you know, because like, you know, 58 years old. Right. And I don't see as well. And it's like, man, do I really need to be able to see that well to win a match? And it's refreshing to hear you say, well, no, I really pay attention to the way that target swings. And I think that's, uh, that's, I think that's the way Morgan is like Morgan can see, you know, he can see trace and, you know, the path of the bullet and all that, but he's really paying attention to what that target's doing. I mean, it, you know, and understanding like trends and can, you know, like, okay, like should the target trending be hitting on this side or that side. And then like, that's confirming what I'm going to do for the next shot. 
and then center it up. I mean, like I think that I think more shooters are like that than ones who have that really good vision that have the ability to watch where that bullet goes. And so, and, yeah. and, you, and you won that match. I mean, you won one of the difficult, most difficult matches in the country, some of the best shooters and you're not, and you don't have that level of vision, which is encouraging to me. I mean, so. Yeah. Well, I don't, there's, um, there for every, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> this may upset some people, but I'll just say my thoughts for every 10 people who say, I see everything. There's probably a couple in there that really do. And, um, so that I don't offend him, I'll say, I do believe Nate sees pretty much what he's saying because I watch him make these micro corrections where I'm, I'm like, oh, he's not going to see that. And then he makes a perfect correction to center a lot of times, you know, like there are some guys out there that really do, I think, see more than more than you can imagine. Um, me not being one of them. But for every guy that says that, there's a lot of people who I don't know if they think they see everything. I've seen people say 100% confident what they just did, and they were 100% wrong. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, whether we get into it or I just, you know, let it let it go, and I just know like, okay, there's no way that that's right because we all saw it or whatever. But um, and I, on the flip side, I've also seen us all be wrong. You know, I've seen the whole peanut gallery agree on one call <laughs> and I'm the only guy and you know, I have to look at that and go, well, am I really right? But then, you know, I just, I know a lot of people misinterpret stuff and I, I can do it too. You know, it's, it's like a, it's a 50, 50. I could disagree with everybody and half the time I'm right. And I'm like, yeah, I know better than them. And then half the time I think I'm right. And then, you know, I'm end up being wrong. It's just, there's so many variables down there and it's happening so fast. Um, I just, it's hard to be perfectly consistent like that. Um, you know, but I, I think, I truly think you have people who can spot everything like that. And that's your, that's your golden ticket. That's what's going to make you rise to the top. Then you have the people who maybe can't see it, but their mental clarity is hundred percent. You know, you could, you could not even tell them where the bullet hit. You can make them close their eyes. And as long as they know they hit that target, they'll know how to hit the next one and they can process it. You know, I think Bushman explains how he kind of runs his wind from one target to the next on a troop line. He's like, well, it's, it's 50% further. So if you apply 50% to your, to your first wind call. And I'm like, dude, what, <laughs> you know, everybody's in a different gear and everybody comes up with their, with like the same answer a different way. And I think it's, depending on the match, the environment, the conditions, and whether or not you woke up on the right side of the bed that day, your gear and your, your setup and process is going to shine that day or somebody else's might outshine yours, you know? Yeah. Um, there's just, there's so many good people and it's like, we all skin that cat different way. Yeah. There are, there are a lot of ways to skin the cat. I mean, like whether it's your, your practice, you know, methods, your, you know, your pre-match prep, you know, your mental approach, your, I mean, different bullets and speeds and equipment and, oh my gosh, a lot of, a lot of ways to win a match. Yeah. But I do think it, a lot of it just, you know, you, you've shot a lot of matches. I mean, I think I was looking on the PRS here, uh, 126 total PRS matches. No, so you shot 53 two days and 59 one day matches. I mean, like that, oh, okay. there's, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot that you do that you don't think about that you're doing, you know, like a lot of data that's kind of going into, you know, that, 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 that decision on where you're going to pull that, you know, aim that next shot that you're not even thinking about just because of how many matches you've shot and things that you are now part of your subconscious thought, you know, so. Yeah. That certainly comes into play, but. Yeah, that was a good, that was, I mean, that was a, Pretty awesome there, dude. So now like getting up, getting ready for a match. I mean, like, are you, what are you doing anything special for like match prep or uh, equipment <laughs> preparation? I mean, or, or like, what do you like? Did you do anything different this weekend getting ready to go to that match? I definitely did something different, um, but I don't think that's the solution. <laughs> I yeah. just, well, that's true. It, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Um, I have, I have a very, uh, strict process of just making sure everything's ready. Um, and I, I don't get a lot of range time. I don't, I don't have the opportunity with just the way my lifestyle is now. I've got four kids and a very busy job sometimes. Um, 
And uh, it seems like every time there's a day to go to the range, I have to work or something else comes up. So at a minimum, I like to get to the range the week before the match, you know, and um, at least just, you know, check zero and speed and just, it's really just like a cursory check that nothing's wrong um, at a minimum. And I didn't even really get to do that um, this last week. Uh, and then uh, usually I just make sure the gun is totally torqued everywhere properly. Like, I mean, I have, it's so meticulous. It's just funny. I'm laughing at myself because um, this last week, I know you kind of know, but I had, we had a, a little family medical situation going on and uh, on Monday leading up to the match weekend. And it wasn't supposed to be a big deal and it turned into like an emergency. And it was something we had to deal with for a couple of days and it pretty much died out at that point, but I just couldn't shake the feeling that like, I really probably don't need to go to this match. And my wife, who's just like, she is, she's more motivated for the PRS for me than I am for myself sometimes. And she's so like, just, you know, so encouraging. And she's like, you gotta go. You can't miss it. She goes, it's the colors match. You gotta go. So, so she pushed me out the door and I went and I had, um, all I had was ammo in my rifle and I managed to stop at twisted barrel on Friday, halfway on the drive, just check zero and chronograph just so that I didn't have to go into Saturday morning knowing or not knowing anything about my gun at that point. Um, so, but, uh, and, and that worked in this case, but like, I don't pass up a train up day usually, you know, like a Friday and I didn't make it this time. Um, and I also don't just like, Oh, I'm going to check 20 rounds and put the gun up. I'm going to rest. I'm going to conserve my energy. I'm not that guy. I'm like, I'm going to, I brought a hundred rounds in this gun. And then I've got another 50 if I want to shoot, you know, a little more and I will make a full day out of that Friday most of the time. And, um, because I don't get to practice a lot. So I'm always trying to get as much out of it as I can. Um, so that didn't happen this last time. It still worked. Um, you know, there's a lot of shooters that kind of just show up and, and do really well. So there's definitely, uh, yeah, that's definitely a thing. Um, but normally, normally I am checking my rifle from end to end on anything that needs to work. I'm making sure everything's clean. Um, I'll kind of go through my bag and make sure all my gear is in there. Um, and uh, if I've not been to that location, I will kind of try to look at like a little bit of a survey of the land. I mean, it's, I wish I could get down like a 3D graphic. I mean, Google Earth does it a little bit, but like usually can't get that much out of it. But if I haven't been somewhere, I'll try to look at it and just at least figure out which direction am I shooting? You know, what's it kind of look like? Um, and then with a Friday train up and a matchbook, I'm a big prepper. Like I try to get everything done. It's almost like I always think of the firefighters, how they, their boots are attached to their pants at the bottom of the bed, you know, and they jump out of bed into their clothes and they go, right? Like I try to make it so that I don't have to do anything uh, on match day. So Friday night, I'm usually up later than most and I'm making my dope cards if I can, just like putting the stage numbers and the yardages and some stuff like that. And I get as much done as I can. And sometimes it feels crazy, but the next day when everyone's, you know, heads down working on their stuff and putting their target card together for that stage and doing all that stuff, their heads are down. And I'm, I'm usually looking through the glass and I'm spotting and I'm watching and I'm reading the wind and looking at the mirage and analyzing the, the props and coming up with the game plan. And, um, you know, again, you can just walk up at this point. If you shot 50 something matches, uh, there's most of these guys, you walk up to any prop, you know, you just, you can figure it out. You can pretty much just wing it and you're going to do pretty good. Um, but I just try to like capitalize as much as I can on time and um, give myself as much opportunity as I can to uh, just be totally calm, collected and ready to go. And I can put my focus on everything without rushing. So um, that's pretty much it. It's just getting everything ready. Yeah. And sometimes when you don't, it still works. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's because I've torqued my gun 60 times this year. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I also, you know, with, with, uh, other lifestyle things I have going on, I, I am much a checklist person. Um, 
I follow the same the same procedure of how you do something like to a T and where maybe some people like to take a little cut a little corner. I like I'm like, nope, I'm going to do what I did last time. I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do and I'm gonna make sure it's done right. And because I follow that, I think I can I can skip checking torque on my gun because it's been torqued more than once in the last three years, you know? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. that's it. Well, that's pretty cool. All right. Well, uh, I think we're about to wrap this thing up. So um, is there anyone that you would like to thank or recognize before we're done with the podcast? Um, yeah, I will definitely. Um, I did already mention them, but I'll say them again. Um, Masterpiece Arms, thank you for all your support. And the, the podcast is excellent. Um, like I said, I'm super, <laughs> super grateful that I had a chance uh, to get a current win and not uh, miss out on the opportunity to get on your, your podcast here. I mean, like that's, that's a really cool thing. And there's a lot of perks to winning a match, but like getting to do something like this, it's so cool. I, I think it's really awesome. It's exciting. And Good I know there's a lot of people that watch this stuff and uh, it's great for people to be able to learn. You know, we we share so much information at this point. It's, it's really helpful. So thanks for doing that. Um, Wade Studeville, uh, for doing my barrels, uh, he helps me out and does a great job. Just absolutely great work. I haven't changed a load on my barrel in 11 barrels. I don't change anything. Wow. Nothing. Same, same depth, same charge, same everything. And I use, I've used the same brass for 23 firings between, uh, all those barrels and they still work. Um, so, and speaking of ammo, I've recently started working with, uh, Phalanx Arms, uh, which is Mike Burtis's company. He's a shooter in the PRS and he's been, um, loading my ammo. I just don't have time to do it anymore. And, uh, I took a suggestion from a friend to reach out to him and we started talking and, I've uh, been using his ammo and it is at least as good as mine, if not better. And thank God for, it, I wouldn't be able to keep up. I just, I don't have time to load. So, yeah. um, He's been such a huge asset for me this year. And, uh, and that was his ammo uh, that won the match. Uh, Impact, Tate Streeter, thanks for his support. Um, awesome action. We bad, run those bags. I, I would sleep with them if they were a little more comfortable. It's like my baby that, that <laughs> Max that I shoot with. Uh, when people are like, hey, can I use that bag? I'm like, yes, sure. <laughs> Don't rip it, please. <laughs> Uh, they make great stuff. And then Collis, Collis has been running that DLR. Um, that's been doing great for me. And uh, my wife for just being such a huge supporter. I mean, I really, I don't know. For for PRS wives, I think she's 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 at the top. She really she really supports me in an awesome way. And uh, and and I thank God that we're able to do this. I think it's just an incredible sport. And I don't know, I don't know anything anything else like it. I think we're all, we're all really blessed to have this as a thing we can do. Yeah, we are. Yeah. It's a great activity with a lot of great people and, and, you know, we certainly, our, our freedoms are, you know, the, the good Lord has given us to go out there and enjoy it with some good people and we should be very thankful. And I think most people are. So. Yeah. And Keith for taking two calls a day, about five or six days a week. <laughs> yes. And a whole bunch of other friends and, and, and they all know who they are, but. I, I love I love the people in the sport and they are just so good and I'm so happy to have this uh, circle of friends. So thank you all those people too. Well, I know a lot of people were very happy you won the match. I know I certainly was. So I was thrilled to see your name right there at the top and look at the score sheet on on practice score on Sunday afternoon. Uh, just absolutely just thrilled for you. So it's a, a you know another another win at KM, another another two day national victory for you, uh, AG Cup win. Uh, that was a great weekend, Matt, and congratulations. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I think we're going to be done for tonight. Uh, this is Season 2, Episode 10 of the Winter Circle, sponsored by Masterpiece Arms. My name is Phil Cashin, and thank you for watching.